panic. <laughs> Just simple panic. Um, what happened initially was that there were a lot of phone calls going back and forth and a lot of confusion. There were different things you would see depending on what the worm was trying to do to your machine. It would say, hi, I'm deleting all your files, and start listing your files and saying, delete, 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 delete. As I began to read the code and understand some of the things that it could do and started to diagram how it was working and stuff, it became clear to me that it was reasonable threat to the network. The mystery only deepened with the discovery of the process name attached to the worm, a collection of letters which formed the word oils. When I saw the word oils, I immediately knew it was the music band Midnight Oil. And so I began rummaging through my collection of Midnight Oil CDs looking for this lyric, you talk of times of peace for all, but then prepare for war. For a writer and a journalist to kind of unearth where this came from to piece together the, you know, the solution to the mystery was extremely exciting. At the end of the day, the only things we know about the author of The Wank Worm is that he was probably Australian, he was certainly a Midnight Oil fan, and he may or may not have had some political agenda. In reality, the files were still there, they hadn't been moved, they hadn't been touched, but to the average user, uh, at least initially, they thought they'd lost all their work. On the one level, people can look at this as just one huge prank. And there's a lot of truth to that. However, that one huge prank cost me, my employer, my government, a lot of time, a lot of money, and it scared a lot of people needlessly. Did it ever stop a mission? Not to my knowledge. Am I still angry about it? Absolutely. Would I hunt him down if I had more data and I had the authority? No problem. Honestly, I still don't know who the authors of The Worm were. There were some rumors that it was the two chaps down in Australia. And I think years after The Worm was, was released, we've pretty much come to believe that it was Phoenix and Electron. No one has ever been connected as the creator of the wank worm. No one was ever charged. There was innuendo, an accusation, um, but in the end there was never enough evidence to actually go after particular hackers. While the US continued to exert pressure on the Australian authorities to deal with the hacking problem, Electron faced a more immediate crisis. My father was very dedicated to his teaching. When he found out that he had bowel cancer, I don't think it came as a huge surprise to him. He'd had symptoms of bleeding for a long time, but he wanted to finish the year. When he first told me that he had cancer, it seemed hard to believe. I can specifically remember thinking, computers don't get cancer. If you've got a need to control your environment, a computer's definitely easier to interact with than other people. And the sense of control I got from interacting with the computer was certainly in stark contrast to the control I had over other events occurring at the time. Did you hack those vaxxers? No, I went to bed and hung up the phone. You? I got kicked off. Oh. During January 1990, both oh, Phoenix and I were on uni holidays and had a lot of spare time. The pattern was hack, then talk, hack, then talk, check in again, compare notes, and then back to hacking. We had information of their conversations through the telephone intercepts. Yet to prosecute, we had to get evidence on their computers. Early in the piece, we could not get that data. We could get their voices, fine, we could hear what they were saying. They'd say things like, uh, 
electrons, you get that. And we would say frustratedly, you know, didn't see a bloody thing. Eventually, we managed to get the data as well. And that's from the, that's from the original data. We could read the data in real time. That wasn't the problem. We could see it on our screens. But it was when we tried to record it and then play the recording back, all we initially got was a lot of hiss. At the same time, we've got other agencies from overseas and in Australia saying, do something, do something. And we're saying, well, we haven't got all the evidence together yet. While the federal police struggled to solve the problem of recording data, rumours of their investigation spread to the computer underground. Force had a meeting with Phoenix sometime after the legislation was passed and indicated that the federal police had a list and that Phoenix's and my name were on the top of it. Phoenix probably slowed down for a few days, but I'm not sure that I even broke stride. Force left the hacking scene completely and became involved in music. He didn't have the same addiction to hacking that I did. As they became more consumed with hacking, Electron and Phoenix sought more powerful hacking tools to break into more and more computers. The most powerful tool at the time was called Zardoz. Zardoz was a newsletter that was regularly emailed to computer security professionals. It was a record of all the known computer security holes in operating systems, often with detailed instructions on how to exploit them. Zardoz was seen amongst the hacker community as the holy grail. In February 1990, after several hours of trying, Electron finally succeeded in breaking into a computer belonging to Australia's leading scientific research organisation, CSIRO, where he found a complete archive of Zardoz. The only thing that stopped me grabbing it there and then was my modem. It would have taken me hours to download it at 30 characters a second. Not wanting to risk losing such a valuable prize, Electron compressed the Zardoz archive and hid it in a temporary directory on the CSIRO machine. He then started to mail backup copies to accounts he'd hacked at Melbourne University. The university system administrator then warned his CSIRO colleague. prevented the mail from being delivered, the system administrator had failed to notice that Electron's original copy of Zardoz was still hidden on the CSIRO machine. The access details for the machine are mis1.csiro.au, username C. Brown, and the password is Geronimo. Thanks. See ya. I probably wouldn't have given Phoenix Zardoz if I didn't need him to download it. But his modem was eight times less risky for him to download it than it was for me. Phoenix decided to use the even faster connection from the University of Texas in order to retrieve the Zardoz file from the CSIRO computer. At one stage, he found that there wasn't enough drive space on the machine. 